Hey, good evening, New Hope. It's uh, time for Wednesday night Bible study. I apologize for running a couple minutes late this evening. Um, I was just wrapping up. We did staff meeting earlier this morning today, but I uh, was meeting with one of the other staff members that couldn't get here till later, and uh, we just ran a couple minutes over. So I apologize for being a few minutes late, but uh, we're on now, and we're going to get started. Tonight, um, we're going to be uh, continuing our study of the Apostles, um, and tonight we're going to focus on uh, Matthias and Paul, and if we're able to get through all of it, because um, there's quite a bit, obviously, with Paul, um, if we can get through all that tonight, then uh, maybe next week we'll do a summary, and we'll be uh, able to conclude this series that we've been on for for many weeks and uh, we can move on to um, the next thing here in the next uh, couple of weeks but it's been a tremendous study um, as I've said each week I hope that it's been as rewarding for you each week as it has been for me learning about um, these disciples of Christ and and what their character traits are what their strengths and weaknesses are just learning some more about them historically who they were, um, where they fit into the Gospels, and what their contribution was um, during Christ's ministry, as well as after his ascension and with the start of the church. Um, and as we've talked, our, our real objective here is to understand them in a more intimate way so that we can relate to them in some way, right? Uh, relate to them and their character and, and their strengths and weaknesses so that we can become a better uh, a better disciple ourselves. And the point of being a better disciple is, you know, there's a couple of uh, prongs to that, if you will. It's not just about being a better disciple. Um, we're not doing it for God's favor. We're doing it to have a closer relationship with Christ, to be in the Spirit. You know, we have to seek God. We have to knock and we have to ask, you know, and as we engage, as we get in the spirit, um, we're going to find ourselves walking more in the spirit. And we're going to find that God's grace comes to meet us uh, where we are and that we're just, um, it's going to change us. That, that closer relationship as we seek to know him better, as we spend more time studying his word, more time um, just being quiet and communing with him, uh, we're going to become better disciples. In the process of having a more, uh, 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 having a stronger faith and a closer uh, relationship with Christ, and we're exercising that faith and, and getting stronger and more mature as Christians, we get better at serving. We get better at witnessing and evangelizing. We get better at performing the functions of the church. Okay, and that's what this whole journey has really been about. So while I'm yakking away here, um, I want to pull up and make sure that uh, we're, li we're live. I see that we've got several people on. That's awesome. Uh, I appreciate everybody joining us this evening. So as we get started, as always is the, as is always the case, uh, I'd like to start this evening with some prayer concerns. And I'm just scrolling very quickly through uh, our comments and looking for uh, any concerns. I don't see any there, but um, I will mention I see that several of you have already typed in the comments that you're on, and I appreciate you doing that. If you haven't done that, please let me know you're online by, by typing in the comment section your name or anybody that's watching with you. Um, so as we as we think about prayer concerns, I see one name on, and I, uh, you remember Darren and his wife Ann. That Darren came to preach um, to our congregation about his his book um, Three Seventeen and Suicide uh, Survivor. His wife Ann is on, and I'm always thrilled to have have them on watching and their support. But um, Ann had to have emergency surgery on her hand this week um, due to a run in with a with a pit bull. So we want to make sure we um, that she knows that we've been praying for her and we're glad that she's recovering well um, and that the dog Charlie is recovering well is also her dog, not the pit bull. Um, 
We've got some other prayer concerns that um, I, I noted that I want to make sure that we mention this evening. Um, I sent one out, and I apologize. Um, I, I thought I sent it first thing this morning, but it was I found it sitting in my outbox, unfortunately. But um, Perry Hammond. Perry is the son of Bob and Shirley Hammond. And I, I mentioned last week that, and we've been praying for Perry for a while. He's, he's had um, some issues with cancer in his lungs. Um, he was going to Morgantown yesterday and they were evaluating him. He's finished his chemotherapy and they were just evaluating everything to see if it had improved enough to do surgery, if he was in good enough condition strength-wise to do surgery. So the good news is uh, Bob called me yesterday evening to tell me that the, the appointment went well and he was strong enough and the tumor um, had been stabilized enough that they wanted to go have surgery and get it out of there. And so that means they were doing the surgery this afternoon at uh, about 2.15, 2.30 that Perry went into surgery. So I've not received an update from Bob yet on how that has gone. So if you'd please continue to pray for, for Perry, for his doctors, um, also for Bob. You know, Bob is just a saint of a guy, and he's, I know he's sitting over there in his living room um, worried about his son. So um, we just want to cover him in prayer as well. And I, I'm thrilled I had an opportunity to pray with him in person here in my office um, late last week. Also, some that have been out on our prayer chains, and uh, I just want to mention um, Larry Brogan. Um, that request, uh, Larry's having heart surgery. That re request was made from uh, Ron Ward, so we want to lift Larry up as well as his doctors and his family. Um, Bertie and Sharon asked us to pray for Bob Call. Um, also, um, I see that Cora Lee is, is online with us, and Cora Lee had uh, requested some prayer for her, her brother, who's... Uh, his name is Bob, and he lost his wife in December and still having a hard time with that. And, uh, you know, we definitely want to cover uh, them with prayer. And it's a good time to remind ourselves the number, you know, death is ever present. And we preach to it and we preach to salvation every week and 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 our our salvation conquering death. But you know, with this pandemic and everything that we've been through, um, you know, we need to not forget the people that are hurting. We keep talking about, I find myself, you know, we get the anniversary of this and the anniversary of that. A year ago, we were starting this containment and this quarantine. And, you know, we need to remember, too, that so many people were lost. So many people are still struggling with the people that uh, have been lost during that time. And um, whether it's for the pandemic or any reason, and we just need to remember all of them. Um, also, Pat Kelly and Carolyn Mollendick had asked for prayers for Sarah Casto. Um, I guess she uh, had an issue thrown from a horse and had a concussion, so hopefully she's doing better as well. Um, that's all of the prayer concerns I have tonight. Um, in staff, Dr. Carrico mentioned his cousin, C. Lee. Um, we'd prayed for him quite a bit um, late last year. Um, late in the fall, I think early winter, and um, good news, uh, he seems to be doing better and better uh, in his recovery. Um, so God is good, you know. And I, I have to say, several people have, have asked me um, about my my back, and you know, in comparison, my issues really aren't that big a deal compared to what everybody's dealing with, a little pain and discomfort. Um, but I have to share a praise in that... Um, I, um, you know, when they redid, I was supposed to, they did a, redid an MRI on my back to prepare for surgery um, for this disc fragment that was stuck against my spine. And they were going to do the, they finally agreed to do surgery. They said, let's do an MRI and make sure that nothing's moved. And when they redid the MRI, the fragment uh, had, was gone. It had been reabsorbed by the body. And um, that's not unheard of, but it's definitely below 20% um, occurrence that that ever happens. And so, you know, that's the power of having all of you praying for me. And I just, I want to give praise to God for that, and I want to thank all of you for that. I just wanted to share that with you.
Um, and so that nerve is, um, I think it's healing. I'm able to back off some of the pain medicine specifically for that. And that seems to be going great. I just really want to thank all of you and, and make sure that I give praise where praise is due. And that's all glory to God. Um, so let's have a quick word of prayer and let's jump into um, our disciples that we're studying for this evening. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for just another glorious and beautiful day, another opportunity to be together in fellowship, another opportunity to study your word and to study your disciples and your apostles, Lord, that we might be students and that we might also be messengers of the good news, the good news of Jesus Christ, your resurrection and our salvation lord i just mentioned a, a lot of prayers and a lot of concerns that have been brought to our prayer team and we just want to offer all of them up to you lord we know that you are god and we know that all these things are in your hands and that we can trust you and that we can just seek your will lord and whatever that might be um, that if we can trust and just know that you are God, you can give us peace and comfort. And that's all we need. We just need to be closer to you. Lord, be with this study. Be with those that are listening, Lord, that they might be touched, that their heart might be changed, that they might hear something from you through me as we go through this study, Lord, that, that will help them find a closer walk with you. And we can only imagine, Lord, what what a small change like that might mean to somebody further down the road and how you might use us to bring them to you. All of these things we ask in your precious and holy name. Amen. Awesome. It has been, it has been a great day. It's been a busy week. Um, this was my, my first holy week. Um, last week was tremendous. Uh, just a tremendous experience, but also um, crazy busy um, with with the two extra services. And then, you know, I don't know why we thought it would also be a great week to run a, a, or host a, a vaccination clinic uh, right in the middle of Holy Week. Let's just empty the church out, run 1,500 people through for vaccinations, <laughs> then put it all back together. Um, but just tremendous amount of support from my church family and um a wonderful, wonderful weekend celebrating uh, Christ's uh, resurrection and Christ's conquering uh, of death and just an amazing, amazing uh, weekend. So uh, as we uh, dive into uh, tonight's study, uh, I mentioned last week, of course, we studied Judas and um, perfect timing to talk about Judas rolling into Passover the Last Supper, and then the crucifixion with Judas's betrayal of Christ. Um, and so now, you know, we're right in perfect sequence. We've got, uh, we're, we're coming out of Easter and the resurrection, and tonight we're going to talk briefly about Matthias. And, you know, when I say we're going to talk briefly, I, I mean briefly, <laughs> because there's just not a lot there. Um, that and and I do want to move on and talk about Paul. So, excuse me, grab my coffee. So I want to talk about Paul also and uh, try to save a little bit of time to make sure we get through that. So I think for for most of you, you know what I I love about my church family is you guys are very mature um, Christians. Um, you're well studied. Um, and, and, and so I, I think we all understand, you know, we, we all think of the disciples or the apostles and we think of the 12 that we've just completed study of. And, and we don't always think about, okay, well, in the first chapter of Acts, one of the first things that they do is they replace Judas. Now the number 12 was important, um, in Judaism um, and so uh, they didn't want to be uh, 11. They wanted to be 12. 
And so um, when we say, well, who was Matthias? Matthias replaced Judas. That's the long and short of who he is and, and why we're talking about him. Um, as far as his uh, name and etymology of his name, um, Matthias, like Matthew, means gift of God. Um, so scripturally, all we, all we can really say is that he was listed among the twelve, um, but not, not during the Gospels, not during Jesus' ministry. He was listed um, in Acts. Um, and so he was the first apostle to be called by the apostles and not by Christ, um, directly anyway, right? We know that these things are ordained by God, so we know that ultimately he was called by God. Um, so we know he was, he was one of the apostles. We know that, um, and here's an important distinction to make. I'm sorry, I know I've got this light shining behind me. Um, an important distinction to make, and I've talked about it every week. Um, disciples, and we use, we use that word interchangeably with these 12 men. Uh, and I keep reminding us, the disciples were all of the students of Christ. All of the people following him that were students were disciples. What we're really referring to in studying these 12 are apostles. And apostles means messenger. Okay, so they, they were all disciples, but they weren't all apostles. Okay, they're... It says right at the beginning of Acts when we're talking about Matthias, and we'll get into it in a minute, there were roughly 120 disciples at this point. 120, okay, so we're not talking about the 12, we're talking about a much larger group. And they were all disciples, they were all students of Christ, and they had been following him. A lot of them had been there from the beginning, from his bapt baptism by John the Baptist. But we're, we're studying the 12 that were apostles, meaning messengers. Um, so what's important to note here, as we move into Acts and the, and the remaining 11 decide, and mainly you know Peter says, we, we've, we need to be 12 and we're going to replace. He, he sets some criteria. And one, one is that um, they had to have been disciples, meaning with the rest of the larger group, from the beginning, from Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. And the second is that they needed to be present at the ascension. So if you think about that, that's, that's the, the beginning and the end of Christ's earthly ministry. Okay, And so in order to be eligible, if you will, to, uh, be, uh, to replace Judas, th that was the criteria. So when you think about it, that means we know they named two people, Barabbas and um, different Barabbas, obviously, from last week. But Barabbas and Matthias met those criteria, and I'm sure there were many more. But that tells you that there was a large number, number of disciples of that 120 that had been following Jesus from the very beginning. Um, so we need, to, we need to just, in our maturity as we learn here, we need to really understand that when we talk about disciples, we're not just talking about these 12. We're talking about the larger group. When you think of this 12, we could think of them as apostles. But they were also disciples. All right? I think I've beat that horse to death. But um, so... So the disciples decide they're going to get together, that they need to replace Judas. They uh, essentially nominate Barabbas and Matthias that meet these two criteria, having been there from the baptism by John the Baptist all the way through the ascension. And then they, it says they, um, they cast lots, and, and Matthias is selected. And there's a lot to be said, and I'm not going to get way too far into it. There's a lot to be said about this. Um, casting lots and and so I, I studied it quite a bit it's it's used a lot in the Bible in different ways in the Old Testament you know it was a way of resolving a conflict or settling an argument and it's it's um I don't I, I even used the word gambling when we were talking about the Roman centurions um, 
casting lots for Jesus' robe, and maybe that was a wrong characterization, although that's how we think of it. Um, it's more in today's way of thinking what we would do. It, it would be more like flipping a coin than than um, gambling, it, even though there's a, there's a connotation of fate, right? But that's exactly what the point of casting lots was. When they were doing it, they didn't believe it was fate. They believed that in casting the lot, they believed that that was leaving the choice, or the what we would call chance, they believed that that was God deciding. Okay? So they wouldn't literally flip a coin. They would have some other thing. It might be a rock. It might be a piece of wood or whatever. But it was kind of the same idea. Um, somehow... Um, they would they would throw down this lot, whatever it was, and and it was either this or that, and and it took all the human bias out of the equation. It resolved the conflict instantly because that what again what we would call chance today. They believed they didn't believe in chance. Um, that was God, and so by throwing that, I'll use the the visual of a coin because we we can visualize and understand that. By throwing the lot, if it was a coin, by throwing that coin or flipping it, the chance of which side it was going to land on, they believed that was God answering whatever question was before them. Okay, So that's the context of casting lots that they're talking about here throughout the Bible. Now, in doing that, you know, we, can, we can look at it a couple different ways. And, and it's debated, you know, using the phrase casting lots could could have meant they that they literally cast lots it could have just been used as a descriptive tool to, to say they took a vote or that he was selected by the community uh, either by a vote or maybe it was literally lots or maybe they put names on a rock uh, put them in a pot and shook them out whatever but the idea is that he was selected um, from the group and then um, there's some interesting information um, in, in terms of his ministry. Um, I shouldn't say interesting. There's very little information about his ministry, but what we can assume is because he was an apostle, an apostle literally means messenger, then we know that he was sent out to do mission work just like the other apostles. And there's some different uh, traditions about where Matthias would have gone um, to do his mission work. Um, one tradition holds that um, maybe he went to Judea first and then he ended up going into an ancient region, interestingly called Ethiopia, but it's not in Africa like we think this would have been up in um, Eastern Europe, present day um, Georgia. But there, there, one school of thought is that's where he ended up. And, and it comes from it comes from this um, there's an apocryphal text and there's also a Gnostic text one's called the Gospel of Matthias the other's the Gnostic text is called the Acts of Andrew and Matthias but there's stories in there that talk about them being in that area and that there are legends of you know um, uh, heathens and cannibals and all this that that, that uh, and, and that's where they ended up and ultimately where Matthias may have died. The other variant to his mission and his death was that um, that he stayed in Jerusalem and that he died of old age in, in Jerusalem. And so other than the selection process itself, you know, there's not a lot of information there. And so if we look at, like every other um, apostle, and we say, what's the, what's the takeaway here about Matthias? I think that the neat takeaway is, you know, Matthias, um, unlike the other 12, he was the first. He didn't receive a personal invitation, a literal personal invitation from a, from a living, earth-walking Christ. Okay? But, like us, you know, he received his calling through the apostles, right? He was called by God and by, through the Holy Spirit, okay? 
So I think he's a bit of a, a marker, if you will, for us in that he was still able to be a contributing founding member of the church through his mission work and through his life, be an integral leader in how that all went. Um, and, and it didn't matter that he wasn't called literally by a living on earth Christ. He was called um, spiritually by the Holy Spirit. And, and I think that's the takeaway for Matthias in my view. Okay, now I want to transition. I'll look in, real quick in case there's any comments or questions. Um, I don't see any about um, about Matthias, and we'll and we'll move off. Now there was one really interesting note in uh, in my study where there there was some discussion about, and it's a great segue because now we're going to talk about Paul. Okay. It's a great segue because there's there's some discussion and, and you know, only, um, you know, I shouldn't say it that way. I was going to say only, you know, real Bible nerds would get into an argument like this because it doesn't really matter. But it's interesting. Um, Paul versus Matthias. Okay. Some people contend that Matthias, that... Paul was at, I should say, Paul was really intended to be the twelfth apostle replacing Judas, and that, um, and that justification is because, as I mentioned, Matthias was called by Peter, you know, voted on or cast lots on by the group, and other people would say, well, Paul was called by Jesus on the road to Damascus. So Jesus called Paul. He was intended to be the 12th disciple or apostle. Interesting, but in their time, the casting of lots, as I already went through, the casting of lots and, and the fact that those lots fell to Matthias' favor would have been just as strong um, a confirmation that they called the right that God called Matthias. And I think that's important to understand in their context, not ours. Their context, that was just as strong a confirmation of their decision. So it's it's a case where we're trying to apply our way of thinking to their way of thinking, and it doesn't always work um, out of context. But it's an interesting conversation. Um, anyway, moving on, it's a good segue into Paul. Now, I'm going to set a couple of ground rules for myself, I guess, for Paul. Paul's contributions, obviously, um, not only to Christianity and the spread and the, of the, the success of the early church, um, but also to our canonical Bible and everything that we do today. His contribution to that is so vast that it's um, it's insane to think that uh, I'm going to do a character study of Paul in in 20 or 25 minutes so it's that's not going to happen and in reality we could spend the next six months um, just studying Paul um, and especially if we try to if you try to study Paul's contributions well you're you're looking at 13 books in the Bible I mean that's months and years of Bible study all by itself so we're not going there um, I want to treat Paul the same way that we've treated the other apostles, and I want to I want to talk about him in the context of who he was, how he was called, um, very top level. What's his contribution? Um, what was his ministry, and and how did he die? Okay, and so you know, interestingly, when I preached about Galatians, which Paul wrote, you know, I I joked about skipping a rock across the a top of a pond and. That's the only way you can do anything on Paul in, in 20 minutes or so. So, as long as we're all in, a, in agreement here at how this is going to go, um, I think we can do this and make it work, okay? So, I do have a lot of notes on Paul, and, and I'm going to uh, uh, try to stick to, to what I've got here for time's sake, okay? So, transitioning over here to Paul. I... I think everybody listening probably knows this, but I won't. I won't make any assumptions. But uh, so we'll dive in. 
So we know that Paul was actually born Saul. Okay? And I'll come back. There's a really good tidbit here about this whole notion of Saul's name being changed to Paul. And I want to come back and, and talk about that in a minute. Just be prepared to have the boat rocked a little bit. Okay? But Saul was from a town called Tars, Tarsus. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> and so he was born uh, in this in this town Tarsus, and it was in a in a uh, province of of Rome called Cilicia. Okay, being born there um, made him by birth uh, Roman, and so Paul Paul was born with certain privileges and rights as a Roman citizen that um, that weren't afforded to. Uh, Jews, and he was also Jewish, so he was kind of in, in a really interesting state of of being having uh, having both. Sorry, just one second. I'm gonna shut my browser down so I'm not robbing the internet from from our live stream. Hopefully that helps. All right, so. As I was saying, Paul Paul is Paul's Jewish by birth, but he was born in a Roman province, so he's he's got Roman citizenship as well. Okay, and that's really important if you think about that in the context of everything else that you know about his ministry. Um, it really gives you some great perspective as you study um, everything that Paul wrote. Okay, and where uh, the perspective from which he was able to um, preach. So, not only was he Jewish, okay, his father was a Pharisee. And as his father was a Pharisee, Saul was also raised and educated and was a Pharisee. And so, he was um, educated by a very well respected rabbi named Gamaliel, or Gamaliel. Um, and it actually refers to him. He's so well educated and respected as a Pharisee. He's, he's referred to in Philippians chapter three, verses four, six, as the Hebrew of Hebrews. Now think about think about later after he's converted, and and he's talking to an audience of Jews that he's trying to convert. His the credibility that that gives Paul to talk to Jews about Jesus. It's off the chart. Okay, so that's important to remember. But when we think about who Paul was, we also know that before he was converted, he was he was a major persecutor of Christians. Okay, why? Well, he was a Pharisee. He was an educated Pharisee, a multi generational Pharisee at that. So he was very strongly convicted that what the disciples were preaching was blasphemous. That Jesus was not God, he was not the Messiah, and that what these Christians were running around preaching was the worst of the worst level of blasphemy. Okay, it wasn't just that he didn't like Christians, he was a devout Jew and he was a Pharisee. So it starts to give you some um, real perspective on who Saul was, who Paul was. Now, um, I'll come back to his conversion in a minute. I'm just talking about who he was. Of course, we know he was converted um, uh, on the road to Damascus. But Paul was a, a leader in the early church, right? We know um, he was called to be really the apostle to the Gentiles. In, um, I think it was in Acts 9, uh, verse 15, Jesus says, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. So he was the apostle to the Gentiles, and that's clear throughout his ministry. Even though he has this amazing amount of credibility with, with the Jews, he, he made it his personal mission and ministry to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And as we know, I mean... And I preached from it in Galatians, and, and you know, Paul was constantly trying to convince the Gentiles that they didn't have to act like Jews, that, that Christ's salvation was enough. 
and and that they didn't need to adopt the law they didn't need to adopt the Jewish customs they just needed to have faith and accept the salvation of Jesus Christ and and that that was based on faith in the Holy Spirit and that was enough and so that was his mission and then that leads to literally his his missionary work you know Paul established so many churches and and you think of all the other apostles as we went around the 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 loop um, they were all affiliated with this church or that church but when you think of Paul Paul made three very long mission trips his mission trips ran the whole circuit you know he didn't go to you know he's not accredited with a church he, he had he had some hand in in virtually all of them uh, as he ran the circuit and he wrote his epistles and his you know whether it was a visit or um a letter or um whatever everything that he did in his mission work is just the the proliferation of the church that's credited to paul's work and and the holy spirit working through him is tremendous um and again we could spend months and months just going through that information um an interesting thing that we don't always think about in terms of who paul was he was a miracle worker the book of acts records that all of the apostles performed miracles um and paul's paul's no exception to that he he healed people he cast out spirits um he even brought um someone back from the dead um so i'm not going to go into the details on each of these but i'll reference them for you um in acts 13 11 you know he made a sorcerer go temporarily blind in acts 14 8 through 10 he healed a man who had been lame since birth in acts 16 16 to 18 he cast out spirits uh he cast out a spirit that was annoying him in acts 16 uh, verse 16 through 18. Oh, I'm sorry, I just did that one. Acts 19, 11 through 12. He healed people and cast out spirits um, through items that he touched. Um, in Acts 20, 9 through 12, he resurrected a young man named um, uh, Eutychus. And, and there was an interesting note there that said he maybe if he hadn't knocked him out of the window, he wouldn't have had to resurrect him. But that's a different story. We, we can look at later he was bit by a venomous snake and nothing happened to him that was in acts 28 and then he healed a man with the fever and dysentery in acts 28 verse 8 so he's associated um, with those miracles and those people who saw and heard paul um, do these miracles that proves his authority right it proved his authority from god just in the same manner that um, jesus's miracles demonstrated uh, the same thing and, and that's explained to us in mark chapter 2 verse 10 so that's a very condensed and fast highlighted version of who paul was he was all of those things um, and a lot more frankly but paul's calling is what we're probably most familiar with um, the road to damascus his conversion on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, just, it's, you know, it's one of, obviously the most remarkable moment in Paul's life, but it's just an amazing example for all of us in that, you know, the, any summary of Paul is going to be about those two extremes. You know, when we talk about what's the takeaway from Paul, it's, it's that God is sovereign and God will use whomever he chooses in whatever way he chooses he is going to his will will be done right and paul is proof um his conversion um you know it's 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 the two extremes persecution um of christians to one of the strongest proponents of success of the early church so this encounter is referred to, obviously, as the road to Damascus, the Damascus conversion. Um, but he was on his way to round up more Christians 
and he'd been he'd asked the high priest for you know he had already witnessed the um, stoning of Stephen and he you know he approved it for the crowds he was delighted in the stoning of Stephen and he asks the high priest for permission to go start imprisoning Christians and he leaves to do this well then Christ comes to him on the road to Damascus Saul Saul why do you persecute me and he and he he blinds him and for three days he's blinded and he doesn't eat you guys know the story but I think the important takeaway is even after Paul knew the true identity he knew uh, the identity and the power of Christ the one that he was persecuting he still didn't know of his grace and so the second part of the story where you know he's afflicted he's blind and he, he's not seeing he's not eating and and, and God calls um, Ananias to he says listen I, I've I'm working on this guy over here Ananias I need you to go to him he's I told him that that somebody with your name was going to come and restore his sight and so now you need to go lay your hands on him and and this is going to seal the deal. I mean, there's a great sermon in and of itself there about how God can use you. And Ananias is like, hey, I know who this guy is. I've heard he he um, he arrests and kills Christians. I'm not sure that I want to go help you with this, God. And God says, no, you're, you're going to go do this. He, this is, this is, uh, you're going to change the world. Just do what I tell you to do. And so Ananias goes on faith, and and he lays his hands on Paul. And uh, and it restores his sight, and Paul is convicted. Instantly, he knows the grace of Christ, and that's it. Boom! It's done. And um, it's just such an amazing, you know, conversion. And then, you know, Paul runs out, and uh, it, within the next few days, he's out with the with the apostles, converting Christians and sharing his story. Um, and you can imagine it took them a, lot, a, a little while to warm up to him, right? Um, that, it, that it's going to take it's going to take a little while for these guys to warm up to him, um, because they know who he is. And maybe you know, in some regards, maybe they never did. I'm, but um, I think his his um, mission works. His contribution speaks for itself. But I want to come back to this notion, and I found this very interesting, and I won't dwell on it very long. Um, Saul versus Paul. It's great It's great for um, storytelling here, the imagery in this huge conversion that took place on the road. But um, my study challenged my thinking on this, that um, did, did his name actually change? Um, you know, shortly after Saul was converted, right? Luke tells us that, oh, he's also called Paul. Didn't say he was now called Paul, but he's he's also known as Paul. And for the most part, the rest of the Bible refers to him. The rest of the way through the Bible, he's referred to as Paul. But Jesus didn't refer to him as Paul, and he was still called Saul eleven more times after his conversion and so the notion is that while it's true in the Old Testament certainly God occasionally um, changed people's names right Abram became Abraham um, Jacob became Israel um, and that was done to represent a significant change that was made and so it would make sense that Saul became Paul as a result of his conversion but the study presents it more that in reality Saul was his Hebrew name. You know, if I go clear back to the beginning, he was a Roman citizen, um, and he was Jewish. So in a, in a Hellenistic Rome, um, Greek and Roman influences and Jewish influences, most of these apostles had and disciples had Hebrew and Greek names. So Saul was his Hebrew name, and Paul was his Greek name. And, and they're... Supposing that it was less to do with a changing of his name, but that most of his ministry after his conversion was to who? Was to Gentiles, to Greeks. And so they called him by his Greek name, Paul. So just out there for discussion, I think it's an interesting uh, tidbit that I ran across. Um, 
So it just challenges our normal way of thinking on that. So let's move on to uh, his ministry. I've already talked about in terms of who he was. We think of Paul as ter of who he was. We think of his ministry and we think of his missions um, and in the various letters to the churches, okay? Um, churches that he started, churches that he supported, churches that he visited, okay? That's his ministry. Um, and and that's so relevant and still in place today. It's um, it, it's just hard to imagine the the way we function and work through things in the church. It's all so relevant. Um, so I don't need to get into the details of that. That's that's Paul's ministry. Um, his contribution as well. Aside from all of that, if you think about the scope of those church.